And now we come to the word of the Lord, and I'll be reading from Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and and at the gates 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the Son of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And on the wall of the city, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names, the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and its width and its height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel, The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, and the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who has done what is detestable or false but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. I don't know if she could have done a better job with those jewels. I don't know if it was possible. That was fantastic. Thank you, Beth. My first memory of thinking about the end times was when I was in junior high, and we saw these really terrible movies that shouldn't be shown to anyone much less junior high students, about uh, the end times as some would esteem them. My first memory of thinking about the revelation was when I got kicked out of my Bible class senior year for good. Um, The teacher said, uh, in heaven there will be no tears. And I knew the text because I read my Bible a lot, which at the time I thought was what I was supposed to do. Now I see not only was that good, but the Lord was preparing me for ministry. And I said, you know, The text actually says that, right, you understand why I got kicked out. (laughs) 
that he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. So more like there will still be things to mourn, but Jesus will be right there, and that'll be awesome. For the rest of the year, I sat in a junior high classroom and read books and wrote reports on them instead of being allowed to interact with the rest of the seniors in Bible class at Metro Christian Academy. And now, let's be clear, that's not the only thing I did. (laughs) That was just the last thing that I did. (laughs) And I think Revelation is a little bit like Shakespeare in the sense that it's often quoted. Uh, It's a venerated part of the scriptures, perhaps painted as often as anything in the scriptures are painted. And yet most of the time it's taken a little bit out of context, or at least just pieces of it are taken out and focused on, and we don't focus on the whole thing. Even here at the, the beautiful ending of the book, which is really more about a beginning of God's presence being fully on earth, there's still challenging stuff in the book, and I love this about the book. I'm, I'm, I should say I'm coming to love it. That in the midst of the beauty of God's rule and human freedom coming together like nothing we've ever experienced, there are still challenging verses like cowards. Were you a little surprised by that one? Is John adding to the list of sins because fear is, is not a sin, though it's certainly like a lot of things can lead us to sin? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. What's happening is the promises, both of Jesus and of the Old Testament and even of the Revelation, are descending. You know, in the the Beatitudes, I don't know if you've read the beautiful attitudes that Christ described to describe what a follower of his looks like in Matthew chapter five. The the Beatitudes that, that Jesus describes in Matthew chapter five are challenging because some of the truth and the promise of them we experience now and some of the reward that Jesus describes we receive later, right? I don't know if you've read Matthew chapter five before, um, but Jesus speaks about what a follower looks like. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And we don't think that's blessed. We think other things are blessed, but this is where Jesus is encouragingly, uh, in an encouraging way, challenging to us. This is when those promises become fully realized. It is a blessing for you and for me today when uh, the Lord grants us meek, which isn't weak, by the way. Meek is knowledge of our need. When we're aware, as the Revelation would say in chapter 21, that we are thirsty and that Jesus gives us water freely, not through our own merit. But Revelation 21 is the picture of those promises descending and then being fully realized. And we're waiting for them. We're waiting for the time that we understand the beautiful attitudes that Jesus described in chapter five. And the the, the conflicts that Revelation presents to us. You know, it presents to us all the beauty of the picture from the supernatural realm of what it's like to follow Christ. It also shows us what it's like to follow the beast. It shows us the beauty of the holy city which is all that the city of man, Babylon, could never be. It shows us the beauty of the lion who is the lamb and the viciousness of the dragon. And yet we're waiting, right? We're waiting to understand what it means in a spiritual way to have been blessed by being poor in spirit. (laughs) Blessed are those who mourn doesn't feel like a blessing, for they shall be comforted. When? When will we be comforted? Well, in this life, some, we receive the Holy Spirit and the life of life that is the new heart of those who receive the gospel of Jesus, but not fully. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When? Here in Revelation 21. When all of the nations will come into the city for the healing of the whole world. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. When? Here, in Revelation 21, and then in 22. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Our world does not do that. 
When we have been led to be merciful, I think we receive some of the reward. Reward is a word that often sounds challenging or a little off if grace is free, and yet Jesus was very comfortable telling us that the with God life is worth it in this life and in the next. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When? When his presence fills the earth and his rule and human freedom are together because the presence of sin and death has been fully removed. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That actually helps us know why uh, in John's vision he heard that the cowards would not be there. Do you remember who he's writing to? He's writing to people that if they said Jesus is Lord in the wrong context, they would be arrested and in some cases would be put to death for that. So he's writing, and when he says cowards, a first century Christian, especially towards the end of the first century when Revelation was written, would be encouraged to endure, to continue to call Jesus Lord, and that it's worth it in this life and the next, even for those who lose their life here because they said Jesus is Lord. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Revelation 21 reminds us of the promises all throughout scripture, most of which have some fulfillment in this earthly life and most of which are not complete. In the nine o'clock service, A friend read the text and he stopped for a moment at the promise that there will be no crying there because he's in pain. A relative is sick and he was struck by the promise and moved by it. The promises and the city are beginning to come together. The city is made up of, uh, there, there are three parts to the city. It is both place, it is people, and it's the presence of God. And this is what I'm coming to love about the revelation is the tension. So this very challenging description, except for sorcery. I feel like sorcery is not a big deal in the 21st century. But all the other descriptions of those who will not be in the city is challenging to us. And at the same time, the vision of who's going to be in the city is expansive. This is not a city for a handful of people that called Jesus Lord throughout space and time. It is an expansive city, and the nations come into it. These are the people that God has rescued to himself. And John, even in describing the harshness of judgment, also leads us to trust in a, in a very, very broad picture. The people that will be there. It is also a place that is for the nations to heal. And for those of you that are math people and physics people, and those of you that quickly in your head realized how high up the city would have to be and you'd be like, I don't know if the air would be breathable up there. Like, it's okay. The city is not, John had no interest in making the city make mathematical sense. So if you're a little frustrated with him, that's okay. But isn't it fun to know that in addition to the English system and the metric system, we also have the angelic system for measurement? That's kind of fun to know. Things could be even more complicated in the new heavens and the new earth. John was so amazed at the immensity of what he was what he was seeing. You know, some of the most dramatic pictures from the Revelation, John has to be taken in the spirit by an angel. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't, I don't imagine they grabbed him, you know, but John was taken by the spirit to places where he could see the vision clearly. You know, he, like, like us, he saw the beauty of earthly cities, and so the angel had to take him away to show him that earthly cities also oppress people and harm them by the virtue of simply the fact that when people come together, Being so prone to sinfulness, we marginalize and harm one another. Similarly, the angel has to take him in the spirit so that he can see heaven and earth collide and become new. The city is a place. John was amazed at the immensity and the beauty of it and is also a people. These are those with the mark. You know, Revelation presents two marks and everybody gets one of them. You are sealed as a follower of the Lamb or you followed the beast. 
These are the people with the beautiful attitudes of faith that did not enjoy throughout their life the full promises of the Beatitudes because Jesus can say, because he's Jesus, blessed are you when people persecute and revile you. Rejoice. We don't feel like rejoicing. When someone doesn't honor us for forgiving them, when, when, when we're kind and generous as Christians are called to be, the world doesn't make much of that, do they? And yet in the new heavens and the new earth, when we are free from the very presence of sin and of death, it will be a lovely place and there will be many, 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 many lovely people there. It is also a place marked by the presence of God. Eugene Peterson says there's nothing new in the Revelation connecting to all of the uh, Old Testament visions that um, John utilized to inform the vision that he saw. Richard Bauckham, another person that I read, said this part is new. So you can just live in that tension. You can read the books if you want to borrow them. I'm almost done with the sermon series. The presence of God means there's no temple. You know, at the beginning of Revelation in chapters four and five, there's a throne room and it's so busy. There's so much happening. I, every time I try and picture it, it has to move for me to understand. There are beasts, there are 24 elders, the angels are almost an afterthought. There's a sea of glass, which is the, I think, symbolizing the, um, that God in his holiness must be divided from sin and yet now that's gone. Where are the beasts? Where are the elders? Where are the angels? We don't ne- they don't need to surround God anymore. They didn't need to then for him, but for us to understand now, the presence of God fills the world. And right in the middle of this is this reminder. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. This is grace. It is all grace. It is always grace. Those who have been ransomed and rescued into a life of faith, into trusting Christ with their heart and decisions, it's because of his pursuing love. It is, we don't merit. We didn't do anything to merit it. And I hope that you know that. And then in the middle of this beautiful picture of the new heavens and the new earth, God reminds John, who then reminds us, that it is because of his pursuing love that any are marked by the Lamb's mark. The promises in the city descend and collide. Description of the disciples and how uh, their names are, the, the apostles of the Lord, their names mark the city and the tribes. And did you think the order of the directions was a little off? Why would we go east, north, south, west? And I don't know how familiar you are with the Old Testament, but all the jewels that Beth read so excellently are, uh, um, they're they're multiple, they're they're referenced multiple times in the Old Testament for the, the high priest and the garment that the high priest wore. But the order is weird. And here's what I've determined. And I know this is not gonna be interesting to some of you, but I found this fascinating. If John had utilized the order given in, um, Exodus, it would have reminded people of the signs of astrology. And if he had gone with the picture of the earth in a more sequential way, north, south, east, west, perhaps, people would have thought of other religions. And so he, he saw what he saw in terms of the jewels throughout the city, and he ordered them a certain way because this is not the melting pot of the world's religions. This is the one God bringing his very presence to the earth after the destroyers have been destroyed and evil has been extricated through his judgment and his beautiful city reigns. This is the alternative to the city of man in chapter 17 in the same way that there is one lamb and one dragon. There are two beasts and two witnesses There's the mark of the lamb and the mark of the beast. And there was the city of man where all kinds of evil is perpetrated. And then there is the city of God. Did you think that the description of the gold was a little weird? Like it's like, it's both beautiful and see-through? I have not seen gold like this. I think what's happening is the city is, has a lot of jewels. Why? Why? What do we love about jewels? And you're like, I don't love anything about jewels. But when people love jewels, what do they love about them? 
the way they refract light and show us the beauty of that light. The streets of gold are beautiful not because gold is beautiful, but because the streets are pure crystal that refract the light of God being fully with us after his city descends. And sometimes, in my opinion, Christians are a little triumphant about the fact that Jesus will come back and restore things, and yet here is John asking us again to live in the tension of the vision that he got that was incredibly expansive across the world, because what happens in the city? The nations begin coming to the city for healing, to bring whatever glory is left over after the destroyers are destroyed and evil is extracted from the world. The city is for the healing of the world. Isaiah chapter 60, I said Revelation chapter 60 in the first service. There is no Revelation chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60, which I think is a description more expansive and more detailed of what's happening in this verse in Revelation 21, says the kings of the earth will sail to the new heavens and the new earth. And then Revelation tells us that when they arrive in the new heavens and the new earth, perhaps to be hosted by one of us, it is so that then they can go back out and heal So we're like, wait a minute. I thought this was about some kind of Christian enclave. No. This is about followers of Christ accomplishing what followers of God have always been tasked to do. Bring the nations to them, teach them about the with God life, and then go back out into the world for its healing and its good. That was the purpose of the nation of Israel. That is our role today. And it it will be begun anew in a far more dynamic and not at all, in a far more dynamic and pure and perfect way after Jesus descends, after evil is judged and destroyed. This is more of a beginning in Revelation 21 than it is an ending. And by the way, Revelation 60 says they'll sail in on ships. And you're like, I thought the sea was no more. Well, remember that in John's cosmology, the sea, oh yeah, I said cosmology, yeah. In John's cosmology, the sea represents chaos and the chaos that entered the world through sin and death and the parts of the world that not through the influence of Satan but simply because of the curse end up opposing God's will. I think there will still be water because the kings of the earth have to sail in on ships and I do not think there will still be chaos. It will be a place of utter peace. And there will be no night there. I'm 42. I'm not a particularly fearful person, yet occasionally I leave a book, or more specifically a notebook or a pen over here at the office. I live on church property and I walk over. And we have some places where the lights turn on when you walk over. That makes me feel a little better. And then we have other places that are very, very, very dark. And sometimes I'll hear something. It doesn't bother me very much. And then sometimes I'll hear something and it scares me a little bit. And then sometimes the shadows play a little bit, you know? Or sometimes I'm simply, perhaps out of fatigue or perhaps because of my story, I'm a little bit afraid. I don't know about you. Some of you perhaps still afraid of the dark, others not. There will be no night there. And I think we know what that means. And God is inviting us to imagine it through the vision that he gave to John. What about shame? Now, fear isn't a big part of my life, but shame is. I have future shame, I realized. I'm already ashamed of decisions I'm gonna make like next week. Any of you relate to that? Certainly have shame about things I've done in the past, too. Certainly have shame about things that I'm worried about today, but I have, even have future shame. And yet, in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be none of that. Can you imagine God fully expected that in hearing this read aloud, and in simmering in it a little bit, in studying it, perhaps in hearing it preached, we would be encouraged in this life and about the future to know that he will remove all the sources and the power and the presence of fear and of shame. What about anger? Anger is important, but oftentimes it's disproportionate. Oftentimes it's illegitimate. I don't know how often you're angry and how often it's legitimate or illegitimate. Here, it will not exist because it will not need to exist. 
because perfect love and justice and peace will not only be, perfect love and justice and peace will fill the earth. One of the things that annoys me about being 42 is I can't eat very much without getting tired. You know, is it just me? In the new heavens and the new earth, we will feast and we'll either know how much to eat instinctively or have to do that 20 minute thing. You know, you're supposed to wait 20 minutes to figure out if you're full. I know that intellectually, it's, I never do it. And then I get tired and I'm annoyed. I'm like, I just wanted to eat the good food. None of that will happen in the new heavens and the new earth. We'll either know or we'll be able to eat more or we won't, I don't know how it will work. But I know that that silliness will be gone. Do you know that the story of the world and the story of your life will be available to you and you will understand it in light of God's redemptive purposes. Can you even imagine that? I have trouble imagining it myself, that my story and the story of the world could be told in a way that I understood God's redemptive purposes in it. And yet that's the promise of God's presence being fully on earth, meeting up with human freedom And there is no temple there because the most wonderful part of the promise is getting to be with God in ways we can see and sense and understand at all times, entirely free from shame, anger, fear, death, disease. (laughs) Aware, even through our limits, which we will still have in the new heavens and new earth, of his redemptive purposes for the whole world and for us. If you're like me, you have trouble imagining that. And yet that is part of the reason that God gave John this vision, to encourage us today and eternally with the picture of his rule and human freedom coming together. Would you pray with me? Jesus, in our best Christmas hymns, we praise you for becoming flesh and we ask you to wait not a moment longer to return. We are so thankful that you have rescued us and yet we long to experience that rescue moment by moment without temptation or evil or sin or death. We thank you, Lord, for the image that you gave, the vision that you gave to John. And yet in the meantime, until you return, we need you, Holy Spirit, to give us strength to endure, strength to worship you and not anything else, strength to love the neighbors that you've put into our lives. Amen.